Patrick Brown, and this is scripture versus scripture. Today, uh, we're going to cover a subject that's of uh, great uh, importance and interest to a lot of people. Uh, a lot of people look at videos and want to know once they find out the truth about their gene genealogy or their family roots, uh, family tree, uh, whether they are Jew or Gentile, Hebrew uh, or Greek or anything else, uh, a lot of people want to know what am I supposed to do now, especially those who find out that they have a Hebrew past, okay, a descendant from Hebrews. All right, now, this, what I'm about to say, is going to go for uh, everyone, but especially those who want to know if I am a Hebrew, what am I supposed to do now? This video will definitely answer that question. In other words, do I follow the law of Moses? Do I follow the Ten Commandments? Do I follow uh, the law of Christ, which is the law of love? What am I supposed to do in order to be pleasing to God? And this video will help in that regard. What we're going to do is talk about a subject that should help clear it up. Now, there's many ways to clear up this subject. There's many avenues that I can go down and during the course of time through this channel, I'm going to try to cover each and every avenue that I know of and they all end up in the same spot. But today we're going to talk about being in Christ. What does it mean to be in Christ? And if you understand what it means to be in Christ, what that statement means or what that phrase means, this will shed a lot of light. This will uncover a lot of things that is being covered up and keeping people in darkness. It is very simple. We are new creatures in Christ. Okay. In Christ Jesus. Now, I don't care if you want to say Yeshua, Yehoshua, Jesus or some of the other variations of the name Jesus, which is obviously Jesus is a variation of the Hebrew name, Yehoshua. But you know, for the purpose of this video, I'm not here to talk about the name right now. I'm here to talk about us as being obedient children of God. The second Corinthians 5 and 15 says this, and that he died for all, he being Christ, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Now, here we go. We're going to take this slow. I want everybody to get what scripture is saying here to everyone. Now, all right, now, they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves. All right, now, anybody, all right, who's living, who have accepted the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, said that he died for all, all those. All those, and I'm gonna spread stress all those who accept all right his sacrifice should not henceforth live until we don't live for ourselves, we live for Christ. He has purchased us, he has redeemed us, all right, with his own blood. So now you are his position. So what do you do? Everything you do, everything you think, everything who you try to please is Christ. You are his, all right. So we don't live unto ourselves, we live unto Christ, all right. But unto him which died for them, that's Christ, and rose again. That's what it's saying. We no longer live. So this goes back to the question that a lot of people are saying. But we know this, uh, Patrick. That's why we're trying to figure out what are we supposed to do to please him because we want to live for him. All right? So you're on the right track. You are, as a believer in Christ, supposed to live for him. That's true. Now, let's keep going. Wherefore, henceforth we know no man after the flesh. Now, this is very important. The scripture says, once you try to uh, live for Christ, once you admit in your mind that you accepted him as your personal Messiah, once you understand that I'm going to get into the scripture, into the word, and follow his commandments, the commandments of Christ, and remember the commandment of Christ, right? Wherefore, henceforth, we know no man after the faith. Now, you take on another point of view about people. You don't know people after the flesh anymore. It doesn't matter what this person is on the outside, physically, after the flesh, right? After the flesh means what a person is in the flesh, what you see. When you see black, white, Chinese, Greek, uh, 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 Indian, no, all that it says, wherefore, well, henceforth, we know no man after the flesh, right? So there's a whole bunch of people that could be my brother once I become a person that's in Christ. A whole bunch of people that could be my brother. That's not my brother, literally. But spiritually, they are my brother. Yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh. Now, remember, this is the writings of apostles. 
Okay? Specifically, Apostle Paul. He said, yep, at one time we knew Christ after the flesh, right? Right? All the apostles, they walked with him, they died with him. Apostle Paul, he, he got the Damascus Road experience, right? Got trained by Christ himself for three years. However, he says, at this point, we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now, henceforth, we know him no more. Well, they know Christ, but they don't know him no more after the flesh. In other words, that's not important. The flesh is not important. And people need to get that in their head because the Bible is plain here that we know no man after the flesh. We yell, I knew still know you, but now I'm a new creature. Now I know Christ, and now I don't know you after the flesh anymore. I know you spiritually, right? You might be my physical brother in the flesh, but if you don't know Christ, you're not my spiritual brother. The only people who's my spiritual brother are those who have accepted Christ as their Messiah also. All right? Now, therefore, verse 17, if any man be in Christ, why? Why do I don't know you after the flesh anymore? The Bible is plain. It tells you why I don't know you after the flesh. Because if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. I'm going to be slow when I say this. If I am a Hebrew in the flesh, I recognize that I'm not a Hebrew anymore in the spirit. Okay, spiritually, I'm not recognized as a Hebrew. I recognize as a new creature. God has come to make me something else. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, yes, I'm still black. If you're a woman, you're still a woman. Your gender didn't change. Skin color didn't change. Your, your past didn't change. Your family tree didn't change. But I don't recognize you after that. I don't look at that. I'm looking at something else. I'm looking at the blood of Christ. All right? I'm looking at your confession of Christ. I'm looking at your acceptance of the Messiah. And if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things have passed away. All that old stuff has passed away. And we talk about more than just sins. We're talking about that designation that you want to put on yourself and on other people. That designation is no longer valid. It's no longer because God don't look at it, neither should we. God, God said, uh, that's not important to me. What's important to me that you accept my Messiah, that you accept my son. That, that's important to me. All right? Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. How much? Everything has become new. No. Look. I'm talking about being a new creature, and you are a new creature if you are, keyword, in Christ. Not that you know about Christ, you know of Christ, but if you are in Christ, you're a new creature. Now, we got to break down what does it mean to be in Christ? What do we mean by the word in? All right, the Bible is explicit and complete with this process of being in something. We can start back in Genesis chapter 1, verse 11, and we're going to see what the Bible says about being in something. You know the days of creation. You heard this before. Come on, let's not be babes in Christ. Let's not be little children anymore. Let's grow up into the scripture and accept what scripture is telling us. All right? Talking about what it means to be in, in something. Here we go. Genesis chapter 1, verse 11. And God said that the earth bring forth grass, the herb you and seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is, here we go, in itself. Let me say that again. And God said that the earth bring forth grass, the herd yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself. Now, we talk about being in Christ. They're saying the creation, God was making things, and he said, look, its seed is inside of itself upon the earth and it was so, all right? Verse 12, again, here we go, another example. And the earth brought forth grass and herb yielding seed after his kind and the tree yielding fruit whose seed was in itself after his kind. And God saw that it was good, all right, now, in itself. Now we see plainly that when you have a plant, when you have a tree, when you have all this stuff, the seed is inside of itself. Now, even people, men, when they have a son, the Bible says plainly, Abraham had a son, or this person had a son, or Moses had a son, or whoever in the Bible had a son, and his seed, the seed of Abraham, the seed of Moses, the seed of... Huh? So, what? what? Men, we have seed. Women, they have eggs. The, the, <laughs> all right? So, when our seed is in, in implanted into the egg or into the fertile ground of a woman's womb, right? Then that, 
the, the, the people that come forth from us are our children and biblically they are our seed. They carry on for us, all right? So everybody's seed is inside of themselves just like our plants and animal seeds are inside of themselves. So God is talking about something when he says you are in Christ, all right? My children are already inside of me. Your children are already inside of you. The, the next generation is already inside of themselves. The seed is inside of itself. Right? Let's look at something when we talk about Abraham's seed. I mentioned Abraham's seed. Romans 9 and 7 says this. Neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children, but in Isaac shall the seed be called. Now, it says neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children, right? But in Isaac shall thy seed be called. Now, we understand <laughs> we had Isaac. And we had Israel. The promise was through Isaac, not Israel. Both Isaac and Israel are both the seed of Abraham. Both are the descendants of Abraham. But only Isaac is the child of promise. Only Isaac is the seed that God had promised the his covenant with. Right? Only Isaac is the seed that God made his covenant with. So he said, In Isaac thy shall thy seed be called. Right? So let's not uh, get things something confused here. Just because we have some uh, children or descendants or whatever, if God pick whoever he picks in that, God is going to bless in that lineage and that line, God's going to do whatever he says he's going to do. God cannot lie. Now, we have to understand in God's eyes, in God's concept of a seed, whatever your father does, you do. Because you are in him when he did it. Let me say that again. And God's concept of seed, whatever your father does, your forefathers do, your father before them do, whatever, we can go all the way back to Adam, this is the concept of a seed. Whatever they did, you do, because you did it in them. Let me prove it to you. Let's go to scripture, and we're going to see uh, something going on with Levi and Abraham, all right? And we're going to talk about him and Melchizedek. When he met Melchizedek, he won a battle, and he met Melchizedek. This is the uh, confrontation that happened between them. And without all contradiction, the less is blessed of the better. Who was the lesser? It was Abraham, because Melchizedek blessed Abraham. All right? And here men that died received tithes, but there he receiveth them, of whom it is witness that he liveth. All right? Now, here men that die received tithes, but there he receiveth them of whom it is witness that he liveth, right? This is Jesus, this is Christ. And as I may so say, Levi also who received a tithe, paid tithe in Abraham. Now, Levi is the line of priests. Levi is the line that the uh, Israelites were supposed to pay tithes to. However, Levi through Abraham, because he's, he's the seed of Abraham. So in Abraham, Levi paid tithes to who? Melchizedek. Now, wait a minute. What is the priest doing paying tithes to uh, Melchizedek? The priest paid tithes to Melchizedek because Melchizedek is a greater priesthood, right? And the lesser is blessed of the greater. Melchizedek blessed uh, Abraham because Melchizedek is greater and also without contradiction. <laughs> The lesser gives tithes to the greater. Did Melchizedek give tithe to Levi or to Abraham? No, it's the other way around. Abraham gave a tithe to Melchizedek. Do, do, do God give us tithes? No, we give tithes to God. Okay, well, the Hebrews gave tithes to God. That's another conversation. But back then, the Hebrews gave tithes to God, and that is right because the lesser gives tithes to the greater. Right now, Christ is a king and a priest. Right now, just like Melchizedek, Melchizedek was a king and a priest. Therefore, being a greater king and priest than Abraham, Abraham rightly gave him the tithe when he met him. Now, again, I don't want to get into a discussion of tithes and offering, but I'm just here to say that the lesser did give to the greater, and that's right, the right order of giving. In Hebrews chapter 7, starting verse 14, we're going to see something about Jesus when I say he's a king and a priest. We're going to, we're going to see this in Hebrews chapter 7, 14. It says this, for it's evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah. Oh, yeah. we, 
probably need to go to 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 look look, look at something here. Let's look at the family tree of, of Jesus Christ here. Let's look at the family tree because I want to make sure no one's confused about what's going on. Uh, at all. Now, when we start with the genealogy of Abraham, we see that Abraham married Sarah. They had Isaac. Isaac married Rebecca. They had Jacob. Jacob, all right, married Leah. And if you look down, family tree, you see Reuben, you see Simeon, and you see Levi. All right, now, Jesus came from the tribe of Judah, right? So you see Judah there on the Levi, all right? So the scripture is saying this, the priest line is Levi. Levi line is the priesthood in the Old Covenant, all right? That's the priesthood, there's no doubt about it. Too many scriptures to prove it, all right? Now, even further, the sons of uh, Abraham, the high priest, still the sinners of Levi. Now, when we go back and look at Judah, it says this, go back to scripture, for it's evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah, of which, the, of which tribe Moses spake nothing concerning priesthood. What? What? The, the, the Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, none of the books of the law said anything about a priesthood coming out of Judah. But Jesus came out of Judah, and Jesus is a king and a priest. All right? Moses spake nothing concerning the priesthood of this tribe of Judah. And it is yet far more evident for that after the similitude of Melchizedek, there arises another priest. All right, so it's evident that Jesus is rose up after the order of Melchizedek. Again, Melchizedek was a king and a priest, right? So there arises another priest, Jesus Christ himself, who is made not after the law of a carnal commandment, Jesus was not made after the law of a carnal commandment, of carnality, right? But after the power of an endless life. What Jesus is doing, <laughs> he's trying to show you, I'm not after that carnal commandment, the old commandment that you had, the commandment the, uh, that uh, God made with Moses. I'm not under that commandment. There's another commandment that I come to show you, a commandment of the power, a commandment of an endless life, eternal life. For he testified, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Jesus is a priest forever in heavenly places. You see scripture on that as well. But in heavenly places, he's a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, forever giving sacrifices, forever intersecting for us to the Father, interceding for us to the Father, forever, for all time. So that's why when we sin, okay, and we pray and ask God for forgiveness, it's forever covered. Jesus is ever there to be an innocent. He's forever there to be a priest, and he's forever there on the throne in heavenly places on our behalf. All right? So if we are indeed the children of God, then by birth, or I should say by rebirth, we are the seed of God. We are the seed of Christ. That's why the Bible says we are the children of God. Why? We are the seed. We are the seed. Now, if any man is in Christ, see that? God. Christ is God. If any man is in Christ, he is his seed. Therefore, whatever Christ does, we do in him. We do through him. Now, going back to that uh, time that Levi gave, how did he give it? He wasn't even born yet, but he gave it in his father Abraham. So how are we keeping the law? We, we're keeping it through Christ. If we are in Christ, when Christ kept it, we kept it. When Christ kept it, we kept it. Okay, that's that, that what the Bible is trying to teach you. So be in Christ. And not, not only that, you're a new creature. You, you're not the old person under that curse. You're not the old person under that law. You're not the old person under that commandment. You have a new commandment, and it's in Christ. It's Christ's commandment. It's a commandment of love. Okay, that's another video and another thing, uh, another teaching. But we got to get this concept of being in something. Okay? If we, again, are the children of God, then we are the seed of God. We are the seed of Christ, which means we are in him. Whatever he did back on the cross or before the cross, when he kept the law, he kept it for us for all time. Again, he's a priest forever. It never stopped. He kept it for all time. He kept it once for all time. And us being in him have kept it as well. The law has been kept. Now, 
we're not per se keeping it on our own, but he kept it for us and we keep it through him, right? I'm trying to uh, hammer this point home so people won't try to transgress and go back under something that they've been set free from, okay? If, if, if you rebuild the thing that you're destroying, you'll become a transgressor. You went backwards and not forward. You went backwards and not forward, okay? Now, again, the, uh, notice something else. The, the, the lesser uh, was blessed of the greater, so the greater blessed the, the, the lesser? Okay, well, if that's the case, then the priesthood of Melchizedek is greater than the priesthood of Levi under the old covenant, the one that God made with Moses. The new priesthood is greater than it. So why would you want to go back under a, something that's lesser or weaker than something that's greater? Again, transgression, backsliding, going backwards. Okay, this is the description. John 3 and 4 says this. Nicodemus said unto him, right? Talking to Jesus. And we talk about being born again, right? Talk about a seed. We are the seed, all right? We are the seed of Christ. Nicodemus said unto him, Christ, talking to Christ, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb? He's thinking carnally. What did I say about carnally, all right? The, the, Jesus Christ is made not after the law of a carnal commandment, all right? He's not made uh, Hebrews 7 and 16. Jesus Christ is, this is not carnal. This is spiritual. This is something uh, uh, greater than that. Again, people got carnal mind thinking carnally about a spiritual book, talking about spiritual things. Now, this is greater than the carnal. Stop looking at the flesh. Start looking at the spirit. Stop looking at the flesh. Start looking at the spirit. That's the whole of it. That's, that's the hanger. That's the, they got an uh, 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 anchor on you from proceeding on to greater and higher spiritual things being stuck in the flesh and not moving on to the things of the spirit. Nicodemus said unto him, how can a man be born again? Take him carnally. Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, verily, verily, I say unto thee, except the man be born of water and of the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Water is spirit of his physical birth. So Jesus answered the question. He said, you know, can a man be born when he is old? Jesus said, you got to be first born, be born naturally. Right? One is water break. So you got to be born naturally and... After you're born naturally, you have to accept the Messiah and be born spiritually. In other words, reborn, right? So, except the man be born of water and of the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh, and he reiterates. He said, look, people that's born of flesh, that is the, that's born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of spirit is spirit. I'm talking about being born of the spirit. I'm talking about leaving that flesh behind and moving on to something greater, to the spirit. I'm talking about being born of so that which is flesh is flesh, right? You, you're talking about being a physical birth? No, no, I'm talking about something else, Nicodemus. So you need, you need focus. He said, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Verse seven, marvel not. Don't be dismayed. Don't, don't be tripping. Don't think it's weird. Don't think it's impossible. Don't be like, what is he talking about? He said, marvel not that I see it. Unto thee, ye must be born again. You just need to stop thinking carnally and keeping yourself weighed down in things. Now, the law is bondage, right? People should want to get out of Egypt. But no, people want to stay in Egypt for some reason. People, don't, people want to stay in bondage, not realizing they are set free. And you should know the truth, and the truth shall make you free, right? So, and you should be in any man, any man in Christ, he is definitely free indeed. He is free indeed. Get out of bondage. Get out of bondage. Get out of bondage. Christ has set us free from that. Right? Now, let's look at Revelation chapter 5 and verse 9. Right? And see what God has did for us. Right? Revelation 5 verse 9 says this. And they, the believers and the Messiah, sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God. What did he do? When, when Jesus Christ, when he died, when he was slain, when his blood was shed for us, he redeemed us, bought us back. Okay? A lot of people know the scriptures in Deuteronomy, uh, chapter 28, talking about no man shall uh, buy them, no man shall redeem them, buy them back. So we're going to be sold into bondage, and there's nobody to redeem us, buy us back, or rescue us. Well, Christ has redeemed us to God. Christ has rescued us from sin. Christ has rescued us from Satan. Christ has rescued us. He's redeemed us. Through his blood, he bought us back. So that's what the word redeem means there for us. 
So he redeemed us, brought, brought us back and brought us to God by the blood, right? So let me read what scripture say. And has redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every, what? Just the Hebrews, just the Greeks, uh, just the uh, Indians, the Romans, uh, the certain citizens? No. He has redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. Look, stop looking at the flesh. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. So whatever he was, it doesn't matter. You knew anyway. And I know no man after the flesh anymore. Why don't I know him after the flesh anymore? Because I am in Christ. I'm the seed of Christ. Right? Let me say that again. Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seal of the earth. For thou wast slain, Christ was slain, and have redeemed us, brought us back up to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation, and has made us unto our God, king and priest. There it is. And we shall reign on the earth. Now, again, not every nation, not every tribe, even if you're a Hebrew, don't mean that you are the tribe of Levi. Don't mean that you're a tribe of Levi. Most of us are not, are not of the tribe of Levi. But everybody who's in Christ is a king and a priest. Why? Because you're not under the the, the, the uh, old covenant. You're under a new covenant. You have a, a new high priest, Jesus Christ himself. And under this new covenant, everybody who's a seed of Jesus. Jesus is a high priest. Now, well, well, don't wait a bit. The children of Levi were priests. The children of Christ are priests. The children of Christ are kings. Why? Our, <laughs> our Heavenly Father, okay, who have granted us, all right, this position on this earth, you know, if he's a king, then his children are kings, right? If he's a priest, then his children are priests. And we are everything that he is. When I say that, not being God, but I'm trying to say we have by inheritance, the same positions that Christ has. He's a king, his seed becomes kings. He's a priest, his seed becomes priest. That's scripture. That's what the Bible is trying to get us to see and understand. And that's what we must identify with. I hope you've been blessed by this lesson and I hope you understand what it means by being in Christ. And for the record, I'm going to read that again. And hopefully it, you can digest it. You can see the truth in scripture and the word is so plain. Now, when we look back and after this lesson, look at the scripture and what it says. 2 Corinthians 5, 15 through 17 says, And that he died for all, that they which live shall not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Wherefore, henceforth we know no man after the flesh, yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know him. We, him, no more. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. You be blessed with that lesson. I hope you are a person that's in Christ. I hope you are a person that has accepted, has accepted the Messiah and rejected those things that keep us in bondage and living in the peace and the freedom that God has ordained that we should walk in. Let's pray. Father God, Heavenly Father, we just pray that all your children that accept you, Lord, all your children that love you, Lord, all your children that have accepted the Messiah, Lord, walk free, O oh, Heavenly Father, from the bondage, oh, Heavenly Father, of the law. Walk free from the bondage, oh, Heavenly Father, of all these ordinances, oh, Heavenly Father, that are written on stone, Lord, but you have written something in our hearts, Lord, the law of love, Lord, the commandment of Christ. We pray that we follow that and we open our eyes to the truth, O Heavenly Father, and fight for it and teach others that as well. This, O Heavenly Father, we pray in your darling son, Jesus' name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.